I am so glad I got my own copy of the full Nestle Allen 28th edition Critical Greek New Testament. In it, the scholars reveal stuff that you might not believe if I hadn't shown it to you. In the last video, I talked to you about how my book on Greek New Testament papyri relabeled the vast majority of texts Byzantine. Now, I'm going to tell you how serious that is, where this is heading, and how it prepares for one world Bible, for one world religion. And I'm going to do it using their own words as evidence. But I'll start out by telling you the secret of P52, Ryland's 457, as I promised. Do you want to see the plans of the enemy? Hi, I'm David Daniels from Chick Publications. I want you to see the assumptions that text critics make about an actual scrap of papyrus right out of their own books. How do text critics analyze a papyrus like P52? What is P52 anyway? It's this little scrap of paper right here. This is both sides and it's massively enlarged. It has parts of John 18, 31 to 33 on the right side, the front or recto, and 18, 37 to 38 on the left side, the back or verso. This is about the actual size. Look at that. Not a lot to go on, is it? I will come back to this. Let me read to you from Comfort and Barrett, page 365, under textual character. It says, Though the amount of text in P52 is hardly enough to make a positive judgment about its textual character, the text seems to be Alexandrian, Metzger, or what the Elans call normal. Its greatest value is its early date, for it testifies to the fact that the autograph of John's Gospel must have been written before the close of the first century. That sounds so good. Wow! Text scholars figured out that this text is from the early 100s AD. But not so fast. Look carefully at what they said. First, the way they wrote that makes it sound like the Alexandrian text is normal. So, the other 99.182% of texts are not normal? This is the impression a student or even a teacher gets from this. I have the Alon's book here, the text of the New Testament. On page 84, they call P52, this is it here, the earliest manuscript of the New Testament. And on page 99, they call it Normal Text Category 1 Because of Age. So, because of what a couple text critics say, they date Papyrus 52 at 100 to 125 AD. We'll come back to the dating. But first, things first. What kind of text is P52? Let's see. On pages 367 to 368, Comfort and Barrett put out the text of the papyrus where they think it goes. Then other words out of John 18. So how can you tell which is papyrus and which is not? Well, here is the part of the text where you find P52. You can see the front, recto, and the back, verso. And there are brackets. You see them? Well, on each line in various places. Let me show you part of one line, for example. Eston cosmon hina te 
into the world in order that I should bear witness unto the, from John 18, 37. You see those big brackets? They go around some words, and other words are left outside of the brackets. Note that the brackets point backwards, pointing away from each other. So which part is the papyrus text? Is it one, what's inside the brackets? Remember, they're pointing backwards. The papyrus text and the extra Greek. Or is it two, what's outside the brackets? Again, remember, they're backwards. Here's the papyrus text. And here is the extra Greek inside the brackets. Well, if you said two, what's outside the brackets, you are correct. What's outside the brackets is the actual papyrus text. So what's inside the brackets are words that are not part of the papyrus. See, the rest are words that they added based upon their assumptions about the text. This is important. So this is what the text looks like if you surround it with Alexandrian text. Only the yellow is papyrus text. Are you with me? See? I've highlighted it on my own copy of P52 so I can more easily tell which is papyrus and which are the words they added themselves. So now you know that most of the words on this page and in my papyri book are added based on the guesses of men. See the three letter words that are in bold red with a bar over them? They are shortened names for Jesus. The bar over them shows that they're abbreviations. Yesu, Yesun, Yesus. Jesus, in different parts of speech, called cases. Now, I told you that the words added by men were guesses. Well, see the other guesses here? For those same abbreviations of Jesus' name, they used two letters instead of three. And see that black line on the right? See, how many letters were on a line is just a guess, too. The black line marks where the end of the line is in the papyrus book. It's all guesswork. Then guess what? Other than one word, possibly out of place, palin, again, there is no difference in that scrap of papyrus on either side that shows whether it's Alexandrian or not. But, because they dated it before the 300s, it couldn't be Byzantine, so it must be Proto, or early, Alexandrian. Even if it were identical to the King James, they wouldn't call it majority text, and they refused to call it preserved. They just call it Byzantine as if it came from a pretend council of Constantine in the 330s AD. I could go into detail, but let's ask some simple questions. Number one, okay, how do we know it's from 100 to 125 AD, the earliest manuscript of the New Testament? Why? They compared it to other manuscripts. Let me just read one sentence from Comfort and Barrett, page 367. The editors of Oxyrhynchus Papyrus 2533 said that its handwriting could be paralleled with first century documents, but since it had the appearance of being second century, they assigned it a second century date. Wait a minute. All you did was look at his appearance and miraculously you could tell how old it was. All you can see is the handwriting. Think about this a minute. My mom writes like my grandma. If my grandma wrote like her mom, my great-grandma, 
Does that mean some paleographer of the future can date my mom's writing back 100 years? The writing all has the same appearance. So, is the so-called science of paleography really science? Or is it just science falsely so-called? God warned Paul in 1 Timothy, he warned through Paul in 1 Timothy 6.20, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so-called. As I said in another vlog, the former head of the American Historical Association was James Westfall Thompson. He taught at the University of Chicago and the University of California, Berkeley, for years. He never finished his first term as president of the AHA, but he did write one revealing article, his presidential address, and died a few months after that in 1941. It's called The Age of Mabillon and Montfalcon. Here is the real history of paleography dating manuscripts by looking at them. Quote, Lutheranism, Lutheranism and Calvinism were attacks on the historical foundation of the Roman Church. Historical criticism became a Protestant weapon, and documents were used as missiles. See, this means that Protestants were showing that the historical faith was a Bible-believing faith, and Catholicism had no right to come along later and take over God's proper place. Thompson wrote, Finally, the historical attack became so effective that Rome was compelled to fight history with history, to combat fire with fire, since the Reformation was an appeal to history, the Counter-Reformation was forced to use the same instrument with incalculable importance to the development of critical historical scholarship. Don't be confused by this. It means that Catholicism had to make up its own history that would draw people toward Rome and away from a Bible-based faith. And this would all be in the name of scholarship, get it? So, the Catholic Benedictine Order of St. Maur, or the Maurists, got into the act. As Thompson wrote, the Congregation of St. Maur, like the Society of Jesus, was a product of the Counter-Reformation. So, Two groups going against the Reformation, trusting God's preserved words and leaving Catholicism, were the Jesuits and the Maurists. What were the Maurists mainly responsible for? Quote, the auxiliary sciences of paleography and chronology. So, they taught how to look at a document and supposedly Figure out how old it was, whether it was genuine or fake, etc. One of the major figures in this was Bernard de Montfalcon. And one text critic who fell in love with the paleography of Catholic Benedictine Maurist Montfalcon was Constantin Tischendorf. He was the perfect mark for the perfect con. He once wrote about the Sinaiticus, quote, I had seen nothing that could be judged as of a greater antiquity than these Sinaitic pages. Scene. Tischendorf in 1844 used the science of paleography and totally fell for a modern fraud, the so-called oldest and best Sinaiticus. And he's just like Bruce Metzger, Kurt Aland and all the scholars 
who fell for the hoax Codex 2427 for over 70 years. Because of the science of paleography, they said it was from the 1300s and Category 1 even though 2427 was actually a fake created after 1874. You can see all that in the blog, prove it. Do you really think that the Catholic Reformation, the Counter-Reformation, would push the so-called science of paleography if it would lead people to trust the preserved Bible? Of course not. So, what is the goal of the Counter-Reformation? The goal is to get us to doubt our own Bible and trust the Catholic scholars and religion, and eventually their One World Bible. Now, as I told you, my book on the papyri renamed the majority of manuscripts Byzantine, instead of the majority of manuscripts or the preserved Bible. They did this to make it sound like anything, any time, that agrees with the King James and disagrees with the Alexandrian Bibles was only made after changes in 330 AD, and therefore you can't trust it. According to them, this knocked over 99% of the manuscripts out of the running for the coveted title of the oldest and best. Get it? But if you look at my Nestle's 26th or 27th Greek New Testaments, like here at James 1, look at that M. That stands for majority as the majority of manuscripts that agrees with the King James most of the time. So here's James 1 in my Nestle's 26. I kind of highlighted it there. See the M's? Okay. And here is James chapter 1 in my Nestle's 27th. See again? All those M's for majority. But, look at James 1 and my Nestle's 28th. Wait a minute. What's changed? All those M's that stood for majority are now switched to BYZ for Byzantine. They are setting up one world Greek text where you never have to see that pesky majority symbol again. Here's how they're doing it right now. There's a new edition of the Greek New Testament being worked on with piles and piles of text-critical notes. It's called the ECM, the Editio Critica Maior, or Major Critical Edition. Right now, they've only worked on one section, section 4, which is James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st and 2nd, 3rd John, and Jude, called the Catholic Letters. So, quietly, carefully, they're moving through the New Testament, changing M from majority to BYZ for Byzantine. Then, all the new Bible students won't see a massive 99% majority of texts. The symbol for majority will be gone. It says right here, BYZ equals Codices Byzantini, used only in cases where the ECM, the Editio Critica Maior, has already appeared, i.e. up to now in the Catholic letters. And it goes on from there. So they're introducing it one piece at a time. The 29th will have more, and the 30th will probably be full of it. No more majority. In other words, they'll be inoculated, the next generation, against the preserved Bible. It's like being vaccinated against health. The next generation of pastors 
and teachers is already being taught that the Greek behind the King James, and thus the King James Bible, is a horribly changed Byzantine text. They might not even mention that it's 99.182% of Greek text copied and passed down all over the world, but the eight-tenths of 1% Greek manuscripts, the Alexandrian text, the Westcott and Hort text, the scholarly ECM Greek text, is what they pretend is oldest and best. And remember, that Greek is based on the Greek of 1840 hoax, Codex Sinaiticus, and 1475 Codex Vaticanus. And surprise, that eight-tenths of 1% that don't even agree with each other, critical text, is the exact one the Catholic Church and most Protestants and Baptists have now agreed upon as the one world Greek text. The one world Bible for a one world religion is almost here. If you want a one world Bible, then you'll get the one world religion along with it. But if you want the Bible God preserved through the faithful, persecuted believers who'd rather die than let go of their Bible, then in English you don't have to look any further than the King James Bible. That Bible has been here over 400 years. The tried, tested, and proved King James Bible. That's the only Bible and the only authority for me. God bless you and have a wonderful day.